Hello, my name is Kishwani. This K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the official SAT study guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must have this book in front of you while you're working with me on the problems. Make sure you buy. 2020 edition. Today we'll do some problems that you will find on page number 345. Please turn to it. Page 345, as I said, make sure the book is always in front of you so that you can read the problem in its entirety or rather in their entirety. Uh, day number six is today. After watching the video, if you find it helpful and if you decide that you would like to work with me, you can send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. I provide one-to-one -one private tutoring. I can help you with math, the reading, uh, not the reading part, the writing part rather, which, which deals with grammar and the vocabulary. I can do those things. Number 13 is the very first problem on that page there. It has bar graph. I'm not going to reproduce the bar graph on the, on the blackboard because that will take forever. What I will do is give you a summary in the form of a table. So the, there we go. Here we have uh, the weeks. Read the problem yourself and you will see what's going on. We have three colonies, colony A, B, and C, three insect colonies, and those insect colonies will treat it with some kind of some kind of chemical. And uh, we are making the observation of how many insects are still alive uh, two weeks after the treatment, four weeks after the treatment, and six weeks after the treatment, and eight weeks after the treatment. So here we go. So here's the initial before the treatment, then two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. And here are the three colonies, A, B, and C. We have 80, 65, 55, 80, 65, 55. We have 50, 60, 50, 60, 140. And then we have 35, 35, 40, 110. 25, 38, and 80. 25, 38, and 80. And 20, 10, and 50. The reason, the reason I bothered to put the entire thing on the blackboard is you will see here that the vast majority of the people who are going to miss the next problem, the problem that we're dealing with, rather, the vast majority of the problem, vast majority of the people who are going to miss this problem is because they are not reading the graph carefully. Here's, here's the pitfall, right here. It goes from 40 to 38. That's the only thing that's going to get you this question wrong. If you look at the graph carefully, you will see that from, from week 4 to week 6 for the colony B, this thing does not quite go, does, does not quite touch 40. It's just barely, it's just a little bit shy of 40, which means that it did drop. Even though it dropped by very little, it did drop. And here's the first question. First question. Now that we understand this part, the question is very simple. Question number 13 says, which colonies, which colonies decrease consistently? As we can clearly see, it's not colony C. Colony C is very easy to see that it did not drop consistently because it went up from 55 to 140. So C did not drop consistently. A did drop 80, 50, 35, 25, as you see, it works. And so does B, 65, 60, 40, 38, and 10. This is where you have to be careful. It does drop. So that's it, the answer is A and B. Answer is two colonies, A and B, drop consistently, and the answer to the problem is C. These people are very clever. They want to give you the answer choices with A, B, C, D, and they want to give you the colonies with A, B, C. So the two colonies did drop consistently, colony A and B, and therefore the answer is C. If that amuses you. The answer is C. Let's look at the next one. Next one is also just, just as straightforward. There is nothing to it. You just have to take your time. There is nothing to it. In the next problem, number 14, we are looking for ratio. Number 14, we are looking for the ratio and they actually say that we're looking for the closest ratio, which means you have to be very precise. And the reason we cannot be very precise is because we'll see in a second. So we're looking for total at the end in week eight. Total number of insects that we have in week eight compared to the total that we had in the beginning, before before these three colonies were treated with the chemicals. Let's find out. Week eight is right here. Uh, right here, week eight is right here. This last corner, last eight, 
20 plus 10 plus 50, let's put it here, 20 plus 10 plus 50. This is how many insects we had in a tree colony in week 8. And they started out with 80, 65 and 55. 80, 65 and 55. 65 and 55 is the same as 60 plus 60, that's 120. And 80 is 200. Let's see what we have on the top. We have 50, 60, 80. So it's 80 over 200. 80 over 200, let's divide top and bottom by 10. So it's 8 out of 20. 8 out of 20 is of course same as, uh, let's divide top and bottom by 4, 2 fifth. Or rather, yes, 2 fifth. Just divide top and bottom by top and bottom by 4, and the answer is 2 to 5. In other words, in other words, for every five insects that was alive that 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 were that was alive at the beginning of the treatment, by the time we finished the treatment for eight weeks, out of those five, three had gone to meet their makers. Maker rather, not makers. Uh, number fifteen. If you're going to try to be funny. You better make sure that you don't butcher the language, which is what I just did. Number 15. Number 15 says the volume of right circular right circular cylinder, and this is what we want to find out. What's the volume of a right circular cylinder that has a height of that has a height of 2 inches or rather this is given to us this, this big, we are told that the volume of right circular cylinder is 24 pi we are also told that the height is 2 inches and the question is if that's the case what must be the radius of it and if you go that route, listen very carefully if you go that route as you know right circular cylinder as you know right circular cylinder the volume of right circular cylinder depends on how wide open it is on the top and how deep it is. How wide open it is on the top, that's the area of the circle, pi r squared. And how deep it is, is the height. And you will end up with saying that volume equals pi r squared times h. If you go that route, which is the route I went, like a dummy, and if you go that route, you will get it wrong. You will get, based on this thing, if you do the work, you will end up with the answer choice A. And that answer choice is A, I found out the hard way, because I wasn't paying attention. It is not the volume of the right circular cylinder they are talking about. They are talking about right circular cone. They are looking, they're looking for cone. The volume of a right circular cone, we are told, is 24 pi. Let's find out what the volume of a right circular cone is. And the formula for that, for cone, the volume of a cone is equal to one third pi r squared h. And this is not something you have to memorize, this is not something you need to know by heart. They give it to us. The formula is given to us on page number 340. This particular formula is given to us on the form uh, on page 340, and so are many other formulae. Let's, let's continue. So we know volume is 24 pi. Let's put it in here. Volume is 24 pi. It has to equal one third pi r squared is what we want to find, r squared times h which we have told is 2 inches and that's what it is, we simply have to solve for r, there is nothing to it. First thing first, let's divide both sides by pi, if we divide both sides of the equation by pi, the pi is going to drop out, let's divide both sides by 2, we see a 2 here, we see 24 here, let's divide both sides by 2 and 24 is going to become 12. And now bring the 3 here by multiplying 3, to 3 both sides by 3, so we can get rid of this 3 and that's it, we are done. We are left with r squared, and r squared is nice round number. r squared is a nice round number of 3 times 12, which is 36, and nothing to it. r is equal to 6. But like I said, if you misread it, and if you do the work based on the cylinder, you will get an answer, which is also one of the answer choices, because they expect you to make a mistake like that, and that happens to be answer choice A. They want to catch you before you get to even the right one. This one is answer choice B. This is answer choice B, which is the correct answer. So one more time, pay attention. It is not the cylinder they're talking about. It is the cone they're talking about. You must read the questions properly. Otherwise, you don't want to find out that you could have very easily gotten a point. It's a very simple problem, but you will get it wrong like I did because of the lack of attention. Number 16.
let's see what we have in number 16. In number 16, we are on the next page now. We are on page number 346. Here's what is given to us. We are told that the population of city X, population of city X and population of city Y. I don't know why I can't write city. And population of city Y, we were told that they were equal in 2015. Population of city X and population of city Y were equal in 2015, which we're going to present it like this. Population of city X in 2015 was equal to the population of city Y in 2015. Okay, let's continue. What the populations, what the population were in these two cities, we do not know yet. They go on to tell us that from, from 2010 to 2015, they go on to tell us that the population of X went up by 20% and we are told that the population of, of Y went down by 10%. So one is going up by 10%, the other one is going down by, one is going up by 20%, the other one is going down by 10%. Finally, they tell us that the population of city X, population of city X in 2010, we are told, was 120,000 120, people. The question simply is, what was the population of city Y? What was the population of city Y in 2010? Now that we have all the information at our hand, we can set it up properly and figure it out. So, one more time, the populations were equal in 2015, but we are told that from 2010 to 2015, what happened was, in X, the population increased by 20%, in Y, actually dropped by 10%. We are told that the population of X is 120. Question is, what was the population in city Y? Let's do it on the top. So let's set it up nicely. So here we have 2010, 2015. Here we have X and here we have Y. Well, we're going to begin the story from what we know, which is the population of city X in 2010 was 120. We also know that in 2015 they were equal, but we'll get to that in a second. The second thing we know is that the population of X population of X, we were told, has gone up by 20% from 2010 to 2015. 10% of 120 is 12, 20% must be 24. So, population in 2015 is 120 plus 24. 24 comes from 20% of 120. So, that part is done. Now, we can pick up from here. So, that is 144. So, if we know the population of X in 2015, we also know the population of why in 2015? Because we were told that they are equal. Now we can figure out this guy very easily. Based on the fact that, that the population has decreased, population city Y has decreased by 10%, which means whatever this number is, it represents 90% of that number. This 144 that we're seeing here, this 144 that we're seeing here must equal 90%, 90% of population of city Y in 2010. There you go, this is our equation. That's it. All done. All we have to do is solve it and we are done. So, 90% can be written as 9 over 10. How should we? How much fuss do I want to make about it? Let's do 9 over 10 times population of city Y in 2010 has 144. Let's multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 10 over 9. And if we do that, population of city Y in 2010 would be equal to 144 times 10 over 9. 1 plus 4 plus 4 is 9, as long as the sum, S-U-M sum, of the digits of any given number, as long as the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, the number itself is divisible by 3. I hope that you know that. I hope that you knew that. This is divisible by 3 because 1 plus 4 plus 4 is 9, and this is divisible by 3. Let's divide top and bottom by 3. This will become 3. How many, how many 3's does 1 have? 1 has no 3's. What happens to that 1? 1 goes and joins 4 and becomes a 14, and 14 has... 14 has how many threes? 14 has four threes. Four threes are 12. After we take away 12 from the 14, we have a remainder of 2. What happens to the 2? 2 goes and joins the 4 and becomes 24. And 24 has 8 threes. 8 threes are 24. 
We can go one more round because 4 plus 8 is 12, and that's divisible by 3. Let's get rid of this 3. 4 has 1 3. After we take away 3 from the 4, we have a remainder of 1. 1 goes and joins the 8 and becomes 18. 18 has 16. There you go. 16 times 10, it looks like it looks like population. It looks like city of Y had a population of 160,000 in 2010. That's all there is. Just give me one second before we get to the next question. I need a little break. Number 17. Number 17. Number 17 is very straightforward. We are told that the volume of a sphere is given as 4 3rd pi r cube. I'm not going to write everything, but they tell you that this represents the volume of a sphere. What this represents really don't give a, you know, what we don't give. We simply have to solve for r. The question is solve for r. So let's do that. Multiply both sides by the reciprocal. So 4 3rd will become 3 quarters. 3 quarters v will equal pi r squared. Let's bring the pi, let's divide both sides by pi. So 3v over 4 pi will equal r squared. And therefore r is simply, oh, it should be cube. That's the cube, that is squared. That's the cube. That's the cube. And since it's the cube, r is simply cube root of this quantity. There we go. Some of the problems that they give you are very straightforward, very simple, and some of them not so much. That was number 17. Let's move on to number 18. In number 18, oh yeah, yeah. In number 18, we are doing a survey. And here are the results. So we ask people if they engage in certain activity, whatever the activity happens to be, I don't have it written down here. Let's just say going to a movie. Okay? Do you go to a movie? We ask the people, random people, we ask, do you go to a movie? And 31% of the people, here's the answer. And here's the, here are the percentages. 31% of people said never. Do you go to movies? Never ever. Do you go to movies? Yes, rarely. Rarely I go to movies. Oh, I go to movies very often. And always part, you can interpret that all the time. Do you go to movies? All the time I go to movies. That's it. Now, what we're dealing with here, what the question is asking, read the question yourself so you know exactly how it is worded. The words make a difference. The language makes a difference here. I'm going to read to you verbatim. It says, based on the table, which of the following is the closest to the probability that a tablet user, it's a tablet user, not going to a movie, a tablet user answered always, given that the tablet user did not answer never. So what are the odds that if I were to pick 1% at random among these people, that that person will say, will answer in always, given the fact that I have already taken out people who had said never. That's what it says. This is what is known as conditional probability. This is what is known as conditional probability. So we have taken, we have taken out never. Let me write down the top how it is presented. What we're going to need is, let's calculate this thing before I erase it, let's, because we're going to need this number in a second. 4 plus 4 is 8, 9, so it's, that's 9 and 6. It's 69, remember it. It's 69, it's going to go on the bottom, and the question is, oh, there we go, always versus, there we go, it says 31 over 69 is the answer. We'll get to that in a second. The odds we're looking for is always, which is 31%, out of 24, 14, and 31, which is 69. Let me show it to you how, how it's presented. Formally, this is how it's presented. P stands for probability, and here we write always. Given that, did not, did not say never. So one more time, the question here is, 
what are the odds? What are the odds that if I were to pick, if I were to pick one person at random among these people, that that person will say yes? And given the fact that I have already taken out those answers who said never. Anybody who said never to my answer, I'm not counting those. Of the remaining people, of the remaining people who did not say never, they either said always or they said rarely or they said often. Of those people, what are the odds that the one that I pick is going to say always? And that was 31 percent that we saw in the table out of a total 69. That's what we want to find out. 31 over 69, and this is where this is where approximation is going to come in. So I'm going to approximate simply as 30 over 70. Stay with me in the story, okay? Stay with me in the story. That becomes 37. That becomes 37. At this point. At this point, let me just take a look at how much work we have left. We still have one problem left on the page, which has to deal with prob parabola, which is also going to take time. So even though the next one is also going to take quite a bit of time, I'm going to share with you something. I understand. I'm fully cognizant of the fact. I'm fully aware. I'm fully cognizant of the fact that it is a calculator. It is a calculator section, and you are allowed to use calculator. And if that's what you want to do, by all means, Go hog wild. Okay, go bananas with your calculator. I'm just teaching you some skill. Some basic things is good to have. If you know some basic fundamentals in mathematics, it does speed things up instead of having to reach for the bloody calculator in every single problem, every bloody problem in this section. That is not what you should do. Calculator is a tool. It's a tool. Do you understand? And just like any other tool, I use the tool when it, when it speeds things up. I happen to be a proud owner of a hammer. But that does not mean that I go around banging everything that I see. I quite understand that banging is fun, but there's a right place and a time. You understand what I mean? So, I'm going to teach you here how to very quickly approximate this thing. Very quickly. I'm going to raise the thing because we need the room. Okay, stay with me in the story. It's very simple. We're going to do our, we're going to do our tenth. Uh, we're going to do our, our one half. One half, you know already, is 50%. Everybody knows that. One third, of course, everybody knows that it's a 0.33 repeating, but when you're approximating, you don't have to worry about it, you can just use 33%, which is perfectly fine. Let's keep on going. One quarter, everybody knows that's 25%, so far so good, nothing to it. One fifth, one fifth, if you want to find one fifth, we know, if you want to find one fifth, it's very simple, we know that one tenth, one tenth is 10%. We do know that. And therefore, half of that is one fifth. Half of that is one fifth. This is one fifth. And half of that would be. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, I messed it up, didn't I? One fifth. That is not half, sorry. That will become one twentieth. We don't want to take half of it. We want to take two times that amount. I thought I was being so clever. Two times that amount, because two and ten will cancel out, become one fifth. We want to take two times that amount, it was 10%, so one-fifth will be 20%. I should have just told you, which I knew that obviously, one-fifth is 20%. And this is where it comes from. One-tenth is 10%. If you take two times that amount, two and two and ten, you cancel out, become one-fifth is 20%. Let's carry on. One-sixth. One-sixth is very easy. This is 33%. Do you agree? One-third is, I'm not going to do it out because I'm going to mess it up again. One-third is 33%. One-sixth, I hope you're able to see that it is half of one-third. And therefore, half of that amount, half of 32 is 16. But we don't have 32, we have 33, so it's 16 and a half. And these are all approximate. You understand? These are all approximate. This is for, this is accurate, this is accurate, this is accurate, but this is approximate. Now we get to 1 7th. But before we get into 1 7th, let's take care of 1 8th. I know it's taking time. But I'm just trying to show you how I did it. I did not reach for the calculator. And if you know it, it's done in a few seconds. That's the thing. If you know it, it goes very fast. So let's do one eight first. Again, same thing, same idea. We know, we know one quarter is 25%. And one eighth is simply half of one quarter. So half of 25% is simply 12 and a half. And you should know these percentages by heart. They're not that difficult. They're very simple. The only tricky part is one seventh. So let me talk. Let me deal with you. Let me tell you what I do with one seventh. One seventh. One seventh is approximately point one four two eight. Do 
the mnemonic that I use, the memory device that I use, you do have to remember it, the memory device that I use is that it's very simple, 7, it's 1 7, you double it, you get 14, you double the 14, you get 28, and that's how I remember it. Now, if you didn't remember, you can do it out. It does not take that long to do it out. I'm not suggesting that you do it out during the exam. I'm talking about knowing this thing before the, beforehand, before you go and walk in the room to take the exam. One seven. It's, it, it's not that difficult. Let's take a zero. Uh, let's take a decimal there. It becomes a ten. Goes one time. That's seven. You're going to get a three zero. Then goes four times. That's twenty eight. Then it comes two. That's going to go two times. You're going to get fourteen. You're going to get a six, and it's going to go eight times. 7, 7 is a 49, so 7, 8 must be 56, and that's your 60, and it goes on forever. But this is close enough. So what we can say is that 1, 7, 1, 7, it approximately, it is approximately 14 and a quarter percent. And it's good to know these things. It's good to know these things, as I said already many, many times. Now that we know that 1, 7 is 14 and a quarter percent, now we can erase all this thing and we're going to use that knowledge. We're going to pretend that we knew that all along. At this point, we're going to pretend that we knew it all along. So here we go. One seventh is approximately 14 and a quarter percent. We don't have one seventh, we have three seventh. So we multiply it by three. That's all it is. Three times 14 is 42. And then a quarter times three is three quarter. We're looking at about 43 percent. We're looking at about 43 percent. If you look at the answer choices at this point, if you look at the answer choices at this point, a is not the answer because it's too low, 31. B is, and E is not the, uh, D is not the answer, it's 69%. So the choice we have to make is between 38 and 45. Between 38 and 45, 43 comes closer to 45. That is the answer. The answer is C. The answer is C. The question here is, what did we achieve? The answer to that question is, a big fat nothing, but I feel much better. It's out of my system. But like I said, during the exam, it is a calculator section, and if you want to reach for calculator, it's perfectly fine, but don't do it all the time in every single problem. Do it, of course, when it makes things easier, when it, when it speeds things up. Let's do the last one, number 19 on the page. It says that we have a parabola, We have a parabola whose equation looks like this. What is the question asking? It says in the equation above, A is constant, the graph of the equation in the xy plane is a parabola, which of the following is true about the parabola? Oh, they just want us to look at it and just tell us whether it's a maximum or minimum and where does it occur. That's all it is. So let's begin. The very first thing we notice is that it has a negative in front of it. If it is negative in front of it, that tells us the parabola is upside down. Upside down. It's just two words. I know that. It just got mixed up. Upside down. Now, how do we know that? Again, that is not something you need to memorize. You don't have to memorize it. Just understand it. It's much easier to understand the concept than to go around memorizing things like a parrot. It's very simple. Make up a very simple parabola. The simplest parabola is this, y is equal to x squared. And if you plot it, here's your x and here's your y. Zero, when x is zero, y is zero. When x is plus one or minus one, positive one or negative one, the y is going to be one. When x is positive two or negative two, the y is going to be four. That's all you need. Let's plot it very quickly. When x is zero, y is zero. When x is one or negative one, x is positive one or negative one, y is one. When x is positive two or negative two, y is four, two, two, three, four, somewhere up here. There's a nice parabola, you see? There's a nice parabola. The question is, what's going to happen? What's going to happen if you stick a negative sign in front of it? This value, whether it's x, when x is positive one or negative one, y was one, but now it has a negative in sign in front of it. Which means, instead of y being one, y is going to become negative one y is going to be a negative 1. And before, when x was positive 2 or negative 4, y was 4, now it's going to be negative 4. And that's all it is. So all that, all that means is that it's the same parabola, but all of a sudden it's upside down because it's a negative quantity. So far so good. Let's look at the answer choices. 
and see what we can get rid of right now. So that tells us that the parabola, whatever it is, is upside down. So if it is upside down, what does it signify? It signifies that we're looking at the maximum, not the minimum. If the parabola is upside down, whichever parabola is, this is what we're looking at, that's the maximum of it, not minimum. So any answer choice that says minimum, answer choice A and B are wrong. I just looked at them. Answer choice A and B are wrong. I have not looked at C and D as to what they say, but it doesn't matter what C and D say. A and B answer choices are gone. Now let's figure out where does this maximum take place exactly? What are the coordinates of maximum? Okay, stay with me in the story. Again, as I've said several times, don't memorize it, just understand it. Here we go. Okay, pay attention. So this quantity that we see there, x minus 3, this is this quantity we're talking about. This quantity is being squared. Since this is being squared, this quantity is always positive. And it has a negative in front of it. Which means this since this quantity is always positive, as long as this quantity is not zero, anything other than zero, that quantity, whatever it is, whether this quantity turns out to be 7 or 17 or 17,000, whatever this quantity turns out to be, because this is a negative in front of it, you will be taking away something from A. The maximum value, the maximum value, if you want to achieve the maximum value for this y, the maximum value, the maximum value, the y will attain its maximum value, that's what I meant to say, y, y will attain its maximum value when this quantity is 0, when x minus 3 is equal to 0, or technically it's x minus 3 squared, but if x minus 3 squared is 0, then x is 0, but then x minus 3 is 0, and that will happen, x minus 3 will be 0, that will happen when x is equal to 3, voila. When x is equal to 3, one more time, okay, follow my, follow my marker and follow me, when x is equal to 3, you put 3 in here, 3 minus 3 is 0, that whole thing becomes 0, so when x is equal to 3, y is equal to a, and that is the maximum that we have. So the answer choice here is that it attains its maximum value, which means the answer is not a or b, it is either c or d, and, and it says now, now we have established that it attains its maximum when x is equal to 3, and y is equal to a. There we go, and that is answer choice, that is answer choice D. That is answer choice D. That was the end of the page. I don't know how long this video is, but that was the end of the page. I'll meet you again tomorrow, and we'll pick up where we left off our story. As I said in the earlier, in the, in the beginning of the video, if you wish to get hold of me, just send me an email at kashwaniprep at iCloud.com. Alright, bye now.